Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to Gospel Saving Church. Thank you all for coming here and being in our lovely home in McKinney, Texas, where our headquarters is, to Gospel Saving Church. Beautiful church, only been in existence for just a little over a year. We're thankful to God that He's brought us together and He gives us all the wisdom we need to make it through every Sunday and He's teaching us a lot and He's teaching me a lot and I hope He's teaching every one of you a lot. So welcome everybody coming from SoundCloud and YouTube. If you're watching me on YouTube or you're coming from SoundCloud all over the world, welcome. Welcome to Gospel Saving Church, you too. You're just like in my home too as well too, wherever you're at, whatever country you're in, welcome. God bless you and thank you for joining us today. So I'm going to pray and uh, start us off here, and uh, we're going to get going and hear what God has to say to us today. So if you guys want to join me in a word of prayer, and then we'll get rolling. Thank you, almighty King of heaven and earth. Thank you so much, Lord, for your word. Thank you so much, Jesus, for your salvation. Thank you that you've revealed yourself to us through your word and that you can reveal yourself to whomever you choose that seeks you, Lord. You want, you desire to reveal yourself to all those that seek you, Lord God. And that's what you want. You want people to start seeking you, Lord God, to start asking questions, to start thinking, is this all like I did, Lord, 14 years ago when I was an atheist, Lord, how I just started, Lord, is there is there really a God? I just didn't know when I started seeking and then, Lord, Sometime later, here I became a new creature in Christ Jesus, just like your word says. And I thank you for, for transforming me, Lord God, for transforming the evil, hateful person that I used to be, Lord God, and transforming me into the man of God that I am now, Lord. And You gave me a whole new heart and a whole new mind and a whole new attitude, Lord, and a whole new life, a life of no more suffering, a life of no more hatred or evil. Lord, thank you that you can do that for anybody and everybody. Thank you, dear God, that you are the God that saves and that you are the God that transforms. Lord God, we love you. We praise you. We just ask you, Lord God, to bless this message today. And we pray that you'd bless the hearer and that the hearer wouldn't just be the hearer, but they'd, they'd be the doer. Lord, whatever you want us to do, Lord God, I pray that would be what we'd start doing. And we'd listen intently to whatever you say, Master. And we'd start doing the things that you tell us to do, Lord. I pray that you impress upon our hearts all those that will ever watch this video or the audio or whatever, or wherever and whoever, Lord. I pray you'd impress upon their hearts by your Holy Spirit, Lord God, to start doing the things that you say in your word. Teach us today, Holy Spirit. Please teach us today. Give us your wisdom and help us to understand your word. Make it clear to us, Lord. We're not that smart, Lord, Lord compared to you. I don't care who's watching, Lord, or who's listening. We're not that smart compared to you. We love you and we praise you, dear God. And we ask these things all in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So if you guys want to turn in your word today, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 12. Our first section of Matthew chapter 12, we're going to be in Matthew 12 verses 1 through 8. The title of our message today is the Smackdown. The title of our message today is The Smackdown. So we're going to read Matthew 12, 1 through 8, and then we're going to start teaching. So if you guys are open there, let's read. The Bible says, At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Yet I say to you in this place there is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. So what do we have here? 
we have a brand new section. We have a brand new chapter. The translators of the Bible did a good job in breaking this chapter. I don't always agree with where they break the chapter and verse because I think, well, wait, why wouldn't you just go on one or two more verses because it made to see more sense. But here they actually made a good break at a good time. Matthew 12, 1 was a good break. It's a new area. It's a new section. It's a new scene. Things are different. Things have changed. He was in his last scene for a good long while, you know, having those other discussions, you know, uh, woe to unrepentant cities and Jesus gives true rest. He was talking to the multitudes. But here we have a new scene and a new day. Matthew 12, 1. What's the new scene and the new day? At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. So where were they? They were near some grain fields. What were they doing? They were traveling. And it was the Sabbath. That tells us a lot. That tells us a lot. Um, Jesus and his disciples traveled a lot. And they traveled by foot the majority of the time. They did do some boat travel, but they traveled by foot a lot, as they were doing here. They traveled by foot quite a bit, and that's what they were doing here. Uh, we see here uh, that they were going through somewhere on foot. They were going through the grain fields by, on foot. And um, most likely, they were probably going through the grain fields because um, they were trying to get away from the multitudes for a while, to be honest with you. Remember, the multitudes were always around Jesus. Well, when you look at grain fields, high stocks, so on and so forth, generally multitudes were probably not going to be able to travel along with Jesus and his disciples because they were, you know, would have been in a, you know, an area kind of tight, quartered. You know, even if they would have gone through the grain fields, multitudes wouldn't be able to go through them or trample down the grain fields. They wouldn't want to do that, you know. So they probably kind of traveled through, took a little shortcut from wherever they were going. <clears throat> Actually, the Bible says where they were going, but we didn't get there. Just thought about it. But... um they were going through, get rid of the multitudes for a while. But unfortunately, walking makes you hungry. Walking and exercise like a type of form of exercise. And so as, of course, we see that they were walking, of course, they got hungry. So what do people that are, get a little hungry do while they're walking? Well, they, the rest of verse 1. And his disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. So, of course, you know, your body burns more calories when you walk and when you exercise. So, of course, they got a little hungry. So, naturally, when people get a little hungry, they, you know, yeah, get a snack. So, what did they do? They reached out. They plucked some heads of grain and to eat. So, no big deal, right? No big deal at all. Plucked the heads of grain. No problems. They reached out as they were walking through. Plucking this grain would have been no, more, no harder than walking your, your butt to your refrigerator and uh, grabbing a little snack, grabbing an apple from the little apple tray. The grain would have been ready. Uh, it would have been perfect for picking because they wouldn't have picked unripe grain. That would have been nasty. That would have been kind of disgusting. So the grain would have been ready. You know, that would have been easy to pick, nice and easy. Well, it shouldn't have been a big deal. But it was to a certain group of religious Pharisees, a certain group of religious leaders called the Pharisees, who saw them picking and eating, and then we read verse 2, their response. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. So they accused the disciples of breaking the law of God. What law of God were they guilty of breaking? Actually, the fourth commandment of one of the Ten Commandments that God gave the children of Israel back in Exodus 20. We're going to read it. We're going to kind of go through it. If you guys want to go to Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11, we're going to read the law that the Pharisees supposedly said uh, that the disciples were breaking. And then we're going to kind of touch on it. We're going to see if they really were uh, breaking the law. So Exodus 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day, God tells the Hebrews, the Israelites. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in it, in, in them, and rested the seventh. 
Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it, or you could say made it holy. So what did God tell the Jews right then and there? He told them, do not labor and do not work. Simple, right? Don't do any work. Don't do any labor on the Sabbath. In case you're wondering, the Sabbath for the Jews is Friday night at dusk to Saturday night at dusk. That's the Sabbath. The Sabbath is not Sunday. That was a kind of a new first, you know, first century or second century church thing that Christians started doing. They started holding church on Sunday, but it was not the Sabbath. Their Sabbath was Friday night to Saturday night. So simple enough. God says don't work. Or the Pharisees could have been talking about the time when God was bringing the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. And when he did that, of course, they needed to eat. And you have this situation where God is bringing millions of people out of the land of Egypt to give them their promised land, to bring them into the land of Israel. And what happened then is when, well, the people started complaining against God because they realized they got out there, well, we got none to eat. Moses, Moses, what, has God brought us out here into the wilderness to destroy us? You know, where's, where's our food? So God hears from heaven and God's with them and he says, you know what, don't worry about it. Tomorrow they're going to have food. I'm going to make this thing come down and it's going to, after the dew lifts off the ground, they're going to have this, this kind of this white coriander seed, this little circular wafer type of thing. And that's going to be their food. And they ended up calling it manna. Well, of course, God says, according to the Sabbath, this is a little bit before the law was given, God said, you know, coming up, because he knew the law he was going to give, don't gather on the Sabbath. Only gather for six days. And on the sixth day, gather twice as much as you, were gonna, as you gathered the rest of the days. And then as, as long as you just gra gather twice as much as you need on that last Sabbath, on that day before the Sabbath, I'll make it last. Because if they didn't, if they gathered too much on the regular days and it lasted over till the next day, it would actually turn to worms. It would actually turn rotten. God said, I only want you to gather as much as you need. Boy, there's a huge parallel in that. God only gives us exactly what we need every day, right? He only gives us what we need every day. Wow, thank you, Lord. That's awesome. So he told them, go and gather what you need. But on the day before the Sabbath, gather twice as much as you need. And that's the one day of the week that I'll allow you to keep it overnight and then it'll still be good the next day when you go to eat. So, of course, they did that. But, of course, the Sabbath came. And some Jews went out there and they went ahead and looked for food anyway. Even though God said, don't gather food on the Sabbath. And they were, went out and they gathered and God, of course, got angry. And he tells Moses, don't, why, why do these people not keep my commands? Come on, Moses, they should not gather on the Sabbath. I want them to rest. Don't go out of their place. I want them to stay and I want them to rest and I want them to re relax. And then six other days... They can do everything else that they want to do. But, of course, the Jews didn't listen. So maybe the Pharisees could have been talking about that. So, were the Pharisees right? In this section of Scripture, were the Pharisees right? Were they right in accusing Jesus' disciples of breaking the law of God? So we're going to do a little examination to see if they were right or to see if, you know, the Pharisees were right. Don't look for me, but just listen along. Let's listen to what God's idea of work really was. I went ahead and looked at the Hebrew words for labor and for work. Because God, in essence, said, don't do any labor on the Sabbath and do no work. So, of course, then that's what we ought to look at, what, we, what they ought not have been doing. They shouldn't have been doing any kind of labor work. So, the definitions in the Hebrew for labor, number one, to work to serve, and or labor, to work, to do work. Uh, the definition of work is occupation. This would be like your job, the job that you went to every day to make money on. Your occupation, work, or any business. So don't do, when God was selling them, don't do any labor and don't do any work. He was telling them, don't serve others. Don't do any hard labor. Don't do any work. Don't, don't work for your job to make any money. Just relax and rest. Don't do any business on the Sabbath. I remember Nehemiah coming in and building the wall and 
the people from the other lands wanted to come into the land of Israel on the Sabbath and they wanted to trade. This would kind of be what God was saying. Don't do any of your labor. Don't do any of that type of work. Don't do any business. Because, you know, that means that you have to be there and you have to man. Have you ever done a garage sale and you just sit there and you could sit there for two hours where nobody comes through and you think, well, that would be relaxing. You're sitting there. Well, it's not because you're sitting there and you can't go anywhere. You're just stuck. And you're tired and you're like, you're just sitting there and you're waiting for people and that's business. That's why God didn't want them to do any work. It's very hard. It's stressful. It's straining to their bodies. So a question for us to ask, verses 1 and 2. Do we really see Jesus' disciples serving others and doing occupational work and taking care of their business by plucking heads of grain and by eating? Do we really see them doing this type of work by plucking these heads of grain and eating them? <clears throat> Absolutely, positively not. There was no more occupational work or business here than I said earlier than getting off your butt, going to the counter, going to the fridge and grabbing an apple. All they were doing was walking through perfect grain. The stalks were ready. Picking the grain would have been as easy as plucking grapes off a vine. That's how easy this would have been. Just simple, simple, simple stuff. Just passing through. Oh, wow. Oh, I'm a little hungry. Pluck. Oh, man, that's delicious. Wow, did you taste that? That was awesome. And how about the wilderness with the manna? You think that they were maybe gathering their food by plucking these grains of wheat to eat? Well, think about it. I'm walking through, and I want a snack, and I pluck and eat. Now, gathering would be taking the grain and putting them in a bag, and then, okay, where, where can I put this? Where can I store this? Notice how that's different than plucking heads of grain and plopping them in your mouth and pushing along the way. Taking a bite of an apple as you're walking along, they could have plucked a few grains, and as they were walking, it just popped them in, even as they were listening to Jesus, as they were following Jesus, as they were having conversation with Jesus. Absolutely not again. These people were not, Jesus' disciples were not storing. They were not gathering to store. They were just plucking as they were going, easy breezy. Nothing at all to it. And when you look at the heart of the Israelites back in that account where they were going on the Sabbath looking to gather food, that's what exactly what they were doing. They were going to gather more, to store up more. They wanted to store up more. Well, that's exactly what God did not want them to do because he wanted them to rest. Don't store, but rest. I'll give you exactly what you need. So again, we see that Jesus and his disciples were not at fault here for plucking and eating grain. But unfortunately, this is not the only place where these Pharisees got in there and they were complaining about Jesus' disciples and Jesus doing things on the Sabbath. If you guys go to John chapter 5, I'm going to go give an account of the story of, in John chapter 5. Uh, you know, I'm not going to read the whole thing, just a small section out of it. But in John chapter 5, there was a lame man by the pool of Bethesda who had been there for 38 years. He was sick, and he couldn't walk, and he laid on this mat for 38 years. And I believe that his friends may have brought him or not. I don't exactly have the account in front of me, but... Nevertheless, the focus here is he was sitting there for 38 years waiting for a healing. And this pool, they claimed, had some special healing properties. An angel came down and would stir up the water, they'd say. And then the first person that got down into the pool, then he would be healed by God. Well, of course, this man being lame, couldn't walk. He couldn't get up and be the first one down in the pool. So he never got a healing. So he was stuck there for 38 years years until Jesus comes along and he walks up and he has a little exchange with the man and he starts talking to the man you know do you want to be here and the man says well I got nobody to bring me down into the pool and Jesus stands up and he says you know what stand up pick up your mat and walk you're healed you're healed you're done the man stands up picks up his mat, and walks along. I could imagine 38 years. Could you imagine being free after 38 years of laying on a mat and you can't walk? Whoa. Whoa. Praise God. Praise Jesus. He got up and he healed the man, right? You think, what a glorious occasion, right? What an awesome time. What an awesome time for this man. 
I'm sure he's rejoicing. Oh, praise God. He's probably walking along, dancing, singing, praising the Lord until he meets the Pharisees. John 5, 8. Jesus says to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. Immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and he walked. And that day was the Sabbath. Here comes the Pharisees. Here comes the religious leaders. The Jews, therefore, said to him who was cured, It is the Sabbath. It's not lawful to carry your bed. What? What? This man just had a miracle. Praising God, I'm sure people around him are seeing him. Man, this man was by the pool of Bethesda for 38 years. The Bible didn't record all that, but you could just imagine the whole society be like, people knew this guy, and here he is walking around 38 years. He's stuck, and now he's free. Praise God, right? He's free. Whoa! But not to the Pharisees. You're blaspheming the law of God. You're carrying your man on the Sabbath. How dare you? You evil guy. And who did this to you? Who told you? And then they go on to the whole big you know, scene and everything. And the guy's like, I don't know. And Jesus meets him later. But nevertheless, look what the Pharisees were doing. Look what the Pharisees were doing. What was their problem? They were so crazy. What was their problem? Why were they so like this? The problem is the religious leaders had made up their own interpretation on what work and labor of Exodus 20 really meant. But according to Jesus here, when we go down to verse 7, we'll get to that in a little bit just as a, just as a context here. But if you had known what this means I, means, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the guiltless. Jesus said they were not guilty. So their interpretation of the law was wrong. So they were the ones that were at fault. These religious leaders were the ones that were not right. They were interpreting the law of God wrong. And they did that since before Jesus. They're still doing it. They did it after Jesus, and they're still doing it today. Yes, you'd say, but Pastor Ed, really? The Jews are really still that anal about their Sabbath day, you better bet your bottom dollar that they are. So I did a little research and found out about just interesting Sabbath day things. And they had this thing that was created years ago called the Sabbath elevator. The Sabbath elevator, excuse me. These are modern day things that the Jews have considered and putting Sabbath restrictions on. So what they said was, is in Israel or anywhere a Jewish population would have been prevalent, is that Jews, as they went along their day, they, they couldn't use an elevator because if they pushed the button, I want to go to four or five, you just broke the Sabbath law. That's work. Can't, can't even press the button on your elevator. So they made up this special thing called a Sabbath elevator that was for Sabbath Jews who followed the Sabbath restrictions of the law. And what they'd do is they'd get in, and the door would close behind them, and the elevator would go up and stop at every floor. So they didn't have to push a button in order to go up or down. That way they wouldn't break the law. So you think, well, actually, actually not. I mean, that's not too bad. I think it's ridiculous because I don't consider pushing a button breaking the law of God, but they did. So you say, oh, you know, that's one thing. That's you know, all right. That's crazy, but okay. So not a bad idea, except for recently. Some big Jewish rabbi in Israel said, oh no, can't use a Sabbath elevator. Can't use any elevator, in fact. No, because using an elevator causes the use of electricity. And that's breaking the Sabbath law. Can't use electricity. So therefore, I deem now, this is a Pharisee of today now. This is 2013. This is 2012, 2013 that this happened. This is not Jesus' day. They said, no, nope, can't use them anymore. Can't use any elevator and can't use the Sabbath elevator. Because using that electricity is breaking the Sabbath. Absolutely. 
Some big Jewish priest of their day now, today. So what has that done even? This is kind of why Jesus got angry with them here. It's why we call the sermon the smackdown because Jesus smacks them down for what they were trying to do to the disciples, what they were trying to do to the Jewish people of the day. Jesus needs to come back now. Lord, please come back now and smack them down now because they're doing the same thing today. Think about it. If a Jew who lives in an upper floor can't even use a Sabbath elevator to get up to his house or go down when he leaves his apartment, what has that actually done? That's actually made it harder for the Jewish person. It's actually caused them to do more work. Imagine, you may think, oh, well, it's just one person. Well, what about a person with a family? You have a husband, a wife, and maybe four little Jewish boys or girls, right? And maybe one's a, one of them's a little baby, and so what's that going to do? You have to use a stroller, but you can't use an elevator anymore on the Sabbath day. So now you have to go up and down the stairs with your stroller. Let's say you just happen to go grocery shopping, which would be work, and they would be breaking the Sabbath anyway if they did that, but let's just say they went out to an amusement park to go have some fun. To walk the boardwalk. There's a big Jewish community in New York. And there's some Sabbath elevators in New York. Sabbath elevators, excuse me. And so let's say they go to a boardwalk just to walk around and just enjoy the day. Grab a Starbucks coffee or, you know, go on your way, right? Well, then they have to use the stairs. They can't use the elevator, even though it's a Sabbath elevator. Isn't the Sabbath, wasn't God's initial plan for the Sabbath for them to rest? How is having to walk up and down stairs resting? That's exercise, folks. That's not rest. That's exercise. No use of Sabbath elevators makes life harder and makes more work, not less. Unless, of course... These Jewish, maybe, the, maybe this is what the leaders want the people to do. Maybe the leaders want the people to just sit on the couch and because you can't use your TV, because if you can't use a Sabbath elevator, then that means that you couldn't use electricity. That means you can't use electricity for your TV either. And then, of course, we can't use the heater or the air conditioning because that's using electric too. So I can go on and on and on and on and on. Let's not, I don't want to get into a random array because if you can't use electric, that means you can't use anything. You can't turn on your lights. You can't lift the spoon to your mouth. You can't do anything. You just, you're stuck. Let's just, you know what? Just not even get out of bed. Oh, and you can't go to the toilet because then you got to flush the toilet thing. And you, that, oh, that's work. Don't get me started. Jesus was against these religious Pharisees because of this type of attitude as I am against this type of attitude today. This, this kind of attitude kills life. This kind of attitude kills life, and it kills spiritual life. And it's no wonder, it's no wonder in case you didn't know this. This is completely off script. God just brought this up to me. Today, this very day, there are so many Jews, Jews who are atheists. Well, I wonder why. I wonder why. They're atheists because their religious leaders have made it so hard for them to follow God because of the law of God. Who in the world would want to be to know God if all it was was this harsh law, like this taskmaster law business? And God is not that way. God designed the Sabbath for the people so that they could rest, so that they could relax, so that they could enjoy a life day with no work. They did, he didn't make people for the Sabbath. People are not supposed to serve the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day was supposed to serve the people. And of course, why would you want to be an atheist? Well, I don't believe in God. Look at those religious leaders. Look what they're doing. And they're doing it to this very day. And yes, there are many Jews who are atheists to this very day. How sad that is. So we know that these guys were not breaking the Sabbath law and that they were not gathering food. And how do we know for sure? Jesus starts to defend them in verse 3. Now, if they were wrong, Jesus was righteous. And he never sinned, not one time. And breaking the law is a sin. <clears throat> Jesus, the most righteous man ever to live the face of the planet, would not have okayed <clears throat> and defended these disciples if they were in sin and if they were breaking the law. But he does it in a very unorthodox way. 
he decides to rebuke these religious leaders, these Pharisees, in a, in a very unorthodox way. Let me explain. He could have just said, you're wrong. He could have just simply looked, turned around and said, hey, you guys are wrong. He had every right to do it. In fact, his answers many times shut their mouths, as we'll see at the end of the, at the end of this section. Nobody answers Jesus at the end of this section. And this, this is in three different sections, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And not one person answers Jesus after he gets done with these Pharisees. That's why we call the service the smackdown. Because Jesus smacked them down and they didn't even have a reply for him when he gave them what he told them here. So why didn't he just turn around and tell them no? Why didn't he just turn around and say, you're wrong, we're moving on, don't bother us anymore? Why didn't he do that? Instead, he decides to go after their hearts of self-righteousness and their life-killing religion. And that's exactly what he does. He challenges them with their own scriptures in this great smackdown. Let's read verses 3 and 4 where he uses David and his men as an example. Matthew 12, verse 3. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. So this section actually comes out of 1 Samuel 21, 1 through 6. So we're going to go through that section and we're going to hear the whole context of everything that God was really saying in 1 Samuel 21, 1 through 6. And we're going to discuss it. So if you guys want to go there, I'll be giving you the background if you want to go there. 1 Samuel chapter 21. Let me give you the background. David was kind of the up and coming to be soon to be king of all of Israel. There was a man in Israel, and his name was Saul, a guy that God had appointed to be the leader of the children of Israel for that day. Well, Saul, Saul couldn't keep the law of God. He kept breaking the commandments of God, and not the Ten Commandments or not, you know, the whole of the law. He was just breaking just simple obedience to God. God would tell him to do something, and then he just wouldn't do it. God would tell him, you know, I want you to go in and kill all these people and destroy this whole land and destroy everything, even the livestock. And then he would go in and he'd win the battle and he'd take the livestock back. And he just wouldn't be obedient to his creator. So God said, I'm going to put you out and I'm going to put somebody better in your place. And his name, I'm not going to tell you his name, obviously, but he, we know from history that his name was David. He became the greatest king of all of Israel, even I would I would say even over Solomon because David even went to his death following Christ and following God. I don't I don't know if Solomon did. So a little backdrop: David Saul was trying to kill David because he kind of knew this was the guy that God was going to raise up to take my place. I'm going to get him. So David and his men, a small group of men, were fleeing and running away from Saul as Saul was trying to kill him. And here's where we come into First Samuel 21: 1 through 6 where this account that Jesus brings up in Matthew 12 comes up. Now David came to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest. And Ahimelech was afraid when he met David. And he said, why are you alone? And no one's with you. So David said to Ahimelech the priest, the king has ordered me on some business and said to me, do not let anyone know anything about the business which I send you or what I have commanded you. And I have directed my young men to such and such a place. Now, therefore, what have you on hand? Give me five loaves of bread in my hand and whatever can be found. So, of course, David comes in and Himalak gets nervous. Why are you alone, David? David was the commander of all the armies of Israel at the time. And so to see David alone would have been kind of odd. Why, why is David alone? So Himalak got a little nervous. So David kind of lies to him because he was afraid. And yes, David, although he was a great man of God, he made some great mistakes. And here David was afraid that he was going to get found out that he was fleeing from Saul and he didn't want Saul to know where he was because he was running away. And so he lies. So the priest answered David and said, there is no common bread on hand, but there is only holy bread. If, you're, if the young men have at least kept themselves from women, then David answered the priest and said to him, truly, 
women have been kept from us about three days since I came out. And the vessels of the young men are holy, and the bread is in effect common, even though it was consecrated to the vessel this very day. So the priest gave him the holy bread, for there was no bread there but the showbread which had been taken from before the Lord in order to put hot bread in its place on the day when it was taken away. So we see here this account that Jesus brings up was this showbread. It was called showbread. And it was cooked there every so many days and put before the Lord as kind of a, you know, hey, we're doing a religious thing, our Lord. This is what the Lord told him to do. And so this bread was holy bread, and it was only meant to eat by the priests. So David comes in, and he's got his men with him, and they're hungry. So David comes in, and he says, hey, Himelech, I, we need something to eat. Give us something to eat. And Himelech says, no, I can't. The, the bread's holy, you know, so on and so forth. But if you and your men have kept yourselves from women, if you've consecrated or sanctified, you'd say, or kept holy is really what all those words mean, kept holy, for three days, then I'll, I can go ahead and let you eat this bread, even, even though it's only supposed to be for priests. So was David guilty of breaking the law of God? This is one of those areas where we could say yes, and we could say no. He was guilty, but technically he was not guilty. So technically yes, but technically no. Yes, because the letter of the law said nobody but the priests eats the bread. But no, because David and his men, listen to this, this is very careful, this is, this is very careful, very, very, you know, we have to listen to this, we have to understand this. David and his men fulfilled the law and satisfied the law by them being sanctified, therefore they were holy. So, what did the priest say? He asked David if his men's bodies were kept from women, and they were, so their bodies were holy, hence making the bread common, and so therefore they could eat. So it was against the written law of God for anybody other than the priest to eat, but the law was fulfilled and satisfied because David, because of David and his men's holiness before God. So there was provision in the law for holiness. So why did Jesus use this scripture reference to smack down these Pharisees in their condemnation of his disciples? He was trying to show them that they had missed the mark on the interpretation of God's law. These guys had really choked out the true meaning of God's law by their self-righteous attitudes and their interpretations of the law. And Jesus just smacked them down with their own scripture by showing them the special provision that God had made to fulfill the law by holiness. Because, God, because David and his men had kept themselves holy, there was provision in the law because of holiness in order for those men to eat that bread. Go to the second example. Verse 5, why does Jesus, let's look at this one. Jesus uses this one to smack them down too. Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath day the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? What is Jesus talking about? The priests go into the temple and they profane the law of God on the Sabbath and God says it's okay and God says that they're not guiltless or that they are guiltless well in an account and i just happened to use the one that god brought to my mind an account that god gave me for this one is actually the count of the showbread we can actually read in god's command to the priests to moses to the to the children of israel we can use the command that god gave to them about the showbread to see how god allowed the priests to be guiltless even though it was the Sabbath day. It's in Leviticus chapter 24. If you want to turn there, you can. Otherwise, I'm just going to read it. As I said earlier, the context is about the showbread, just like we read about with King David. Leviticus 24, 5 through 9. I'm going to read it. You shall set them in two rows. And right there, you got to see right there, that's God telling them to do something. You shall set them in two rows. Six in a row on the pure gold table before the Lord. And you shall put pure frankincense on each row. Another thing to do, that's two. That it may be on the bread for a memorial, an offering made by fire to the Lord. Every Sabbath he shall set it in order before the Lord continually. 
being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. And it shall be for Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat it in a holy place. For it is most holy to him from the offerings of the Lord made by fire, by a perpetual state. So God not only told him to do it on the Sabbath, he gave him orders of service to do on the Sabbath. But then in case you didn't know, when that last phrase, by a perpetual state, God ordered it to be done. Perpetual state means it's a, it's a commandment and it's an ongoing thing that they were never supposed to stop doing. So God told them, I want you to serve me, serve the temple, and you're going to put out this holy bread, and here's how you're going to do, 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 all on the Sabbath. And you're never supposed to stop doing this labor, and you're never supposed to stop doing this service on the Sabbath. But remember the command that God gave to the Israelites in Exodus 20. You shall do not no labor nor no work on the Sabbath. And remember the definitions of labor and service, or labor and work. Service, work, occupational, business, etc. All the above. Not supposed to do these things on the Sabbath day. But here in Leviticus 24, it sure sounds like God tells the priests to do the kind of work that he just told the Jews not to do in Exodus 20. Huh? Did God change his mind? Is God confused? He's, hmm. Let me see. I, I don't know. I know I just gave them that command. But now I'm going to go ahead and break that command and I'm going to let them perfect. Uh, I'll forget that I did that. I, what? Is God confused? Did he make a mistake? Is God saying that the priest can sin against him on the Sabbath and he doesn't find them guilty? Absolutely, positively not. When, if ever, and I'll challenge anybody ever to find this for me in the Bible and call me, my number's on the website, you can go to gospelsavingchurch.com and ask me any kind of question you want, but where and ever in the scripture does it say, God says, I allow you to sin. Hey, go right ahead. Sin all that you want. Do all that you want to do. Hey, break my laws, break my commands, sin. Go ahead and sin. And never, not one time will you read this. 1 Peter 1.16, God says, Be holy, for I am holy. God does not change, and he's not confused. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Hebrews 13.8. God does not change. So what's the deal? How can the priests not be sinning on the Sabbath when they're absolutely doing the work that God told them not to do? So let me explain. How is it possible? How is it possible that the priests can serve God in the exact work that he told them not to do in Exodus 20, but they still do every Sabbath perpetually. They serve God in that kind of way. The answer, the same as it was for David and his men. Holiness, 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 and more holiness. God made the priests exempt from the Sabbath law because he said that the work needed to be done for the temple and done with no interruptions and perpetually for good and on and on and on and on and on. The priests had to do the work for the temple so that people had a place to come for the Sabbath day to worship God. The Sabbath day was the time that the Jews came and worshiped God at the temple. But if there were no priests there working, if there were no priests there setting up showbread, if there were no priests there doing the holy work of God, then how would anybody have had the Sabbath to, to go to the temple to celebrate the Sabbath of God and to worship God? They would not have been able to. So what do we see again? Jesus' example again. Because of a righteous life, because of holiness, we see another provision in the law because of holiness. Now, why would Jesus give this example in reference to, in defense of his disciples' innocence? Let's read verse 6 and find out. Yet I say to you that in this place, he's speaking about right then and there, there is one greater than the temple. Now, he's speaking of himself as the one greater than the temple. 
Man, get this. This is so powerful. God spoke this to me. It was so powerful. The temple was the holiest place in the religion of Judaism. And Jesus was holier than that. Wow. It was where people went to worship. Get it? Jesus was holier than the temple. We can come to Jesus and worship him. The priests could do work for God in the temple on the Sabbath and not profane it or sin against God's law because they were holy. They had to do holy work. So here's why Jesus uses this defense of his disciples. This is awesome. You ready? This is awesome. How much more would Jesus' disciples be, with him being greater than the temple, be holy and innocent of profaning the Sabbath by working for and with Jesus on the Sabbath. How much more holy would they be? When you add in Revelation 5.10, he has made us kings and priests to our God. And you have these disciples, or God's new covenant kings and priests, being innocent of profaning the Sabbath because they were working with and for the one greater than the temple. Praise be to God. They were innocent on every level because as God showed me in this section of Scripture, the, the Pharisees had completely missed the mark of their letter of the law because guess what really in essence the disciples and even Jesus himself according to them really did break the law every Sabbath because they healed they consider that a breaking of the Sabbath walking around from town to town Jesus and his disciples went from town to town they didn't want that that way they would have considered that labor so Jesus and the disciples according to their letter of the law profane the Sabbath every single Sabbath according to their letter but when we consider Jesus the great high priest and the disciples of Christ, kings and priests, and the way, they woke, they, the way that they worked for and with the one greater than the temple, we see that there was no profaning of the Sabbath because they were doing God's holy work every single Sabbath and every single day. But there's even more to their innocence, if you, can, if you can receive that. There's even more to their innocence. Read verse 7. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the guiltless. Now God is the one that said this statement in Hosea 6.6. 6. But here, in case you missed it, Jesus is stating it as if he is the one that said it. I, if you'd have known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Jesus was quoting Hosea 6.6 6 as if he was the one that was speaking it then and now. Praise be to God. Here, another place, as we see all throughout the New Testament, if there's any Muslims watching, Jesus is proclaiming himself to be God and to be equal with God. And since God made a holy provision for the priests of old, then Jesus, being God, made a holy provision for his disciples or his kings and priests to do holy work on the Sabbath. And here he proclaims their innocence against the accusations of these religious Pharisees. So we have a big finish here. Are we sure that we can really say that Jesus is proclaiming himself equal to God and God himself? Well, let's look, because the Bible always answers these questions. Read verse 8 with me. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. We've read that over I've read that over 50 times, 100 times, but the depth of it, Jesus said, the Son of Man, he's referring to himself. The Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. The Greek word for Lord is kiros. It's defined as the owner, 
the one who has control of a person, the master. I, Jesus said, am the Lord, the master, the owner of the day of the Sabbath. Oh, yes. Jesus is calling himself the master, the owner of the Sabbath day. And, it, and I'm sure even kindergartners can get this one. What does the Bible say about who made the days? Oh, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God, Jehovah, made the heavens and the earth. Yet Jesus said, I own the Sabbath. But God, Genesis 1.1, God made the heavens and the earth. Jesus and God, one. Equal, equal, the same. Praise be to God. Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath, I own this day. And if I own this day, I own these disciples. And because I own them and they're mine and they're my kings and my priests, they're exempted from what you think is Sabbath law. And they can do my holy work. Go sit down. He gives them the powerful smackdown. Jesus laid it down hard. And as I said earlier, you can go to Mark 2, 23 to 28, and Luke 6, 6, 1 through 5, and those are the other parallels of this passage. And guess what? The Pharisees, the religious leaders, shut their mouths. They had nothing to say. There was no reply. Because when other sections of Scripture, when they reply, the Bible adds it. They said, well, you're not the Lord. Wait a minute, you're not, you're not God. And they picked up stones to stone him or whatever the case may be. But here, absolutely no reply by the Pharisees or by any of the religious leaders. Jesus gives them the smackdown of their lifetime and he shuts their mouths. Good. He shuts their mouths. They could not answer him. I, I'm reminded of the woman that was brought to him in adultery. And they said, Jesus, we found this woman and she was practicing adultery. And Jesus bends down and he writes something in the sand. And he stands back up and he says, all right, I hear you. Because they were trying to trap him. He says, you who have not sinned, cast the first stone. So you that are innocent out there, go ahead, take your stones and go ahead and stone her. Not one of them said a word. Not one of them said one thing. One by one, the Bible says, they threw down their rocks and they walked away. Jesus shut the mouths of the Pharisees and the religious leaders and the self-righteous all the time. And here we just saw them smack down these Pharisees who thought they were being smart. They were going to call out his disciples because they were sinning according to their interpretation of the law on the Sabbath. But they were wrong. And Jesus smacked them down. Praise be to God. But now, Jesus isn't just Lord of the Sabbath, folks. Jesus is Lord of all. He's Lord of heaven. He's Lord of earth, which means owner. He's not just Lord of the Sabbath. He's ruler and master of all unseen or seen, whether in heaven, under the heavens, under the oceans, under the seas, everywhere. He's Lord of them all. Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Therefore God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. And in case you missed that until just now, when God says he's given him a name, it's higher above all. All, every name, every all, that would even be saying that God even exalted his name above his name. Hallelujah. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth. Speaking of hell, under the earth. So yes, people in hell that are under the earth will even bow their knee to Jesus and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord 
Kiros, master of all, ruler of all. Jesus Christ is ruler of all. To the glory of God the Father. So, question, please, think today. Is Jesus the Lord of your life? Is Jesus the master of your life? Have you given him that place in your life? Or is he just a belief that's out there like I believe that I'm a white guy and I'm 39 years old and, and I live in McKinney, Texas. Those are all beliefs that I have in my head. Is Jesus just a belief in your head? Or is he the master of your life? of your life. Do you submit to his authority in your daily life, obeying his teachings, honoring his name? Because remember, God tells us in Philippians, God has exalted his name to be above every, all names, while trusting in him with everything that you are, putting your complete trust in him daily, following him and his commands on your life daily, seeking his face daily, getting to know him more daily, obeying him more daily, and living less of what you want and more of what he wants. If that's not you and you can't describe yourself as that, then the Bible says that you are in danger of hell fire. Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no man comes to the Father except by me. God's exalted his name above every name. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess to the glory of God. One day your knee will bow to him. And your tongue will confess his lordship. Whether you want to or not, you're going to do it. I don't believe in God, Pastor Ed. Oh, I'm an atheist. Oh, there's, there's a God out there. I don't necessarily know if Jesus is the way. Well, that's fine. But the moment you die and you stand before God, you will believe then. And your knee will bow and your tongue will confess. You'll be trying to fight it back and hold it. No, just, no, Lord Jesus. And you'll have to. No choice at that point. Your knee will bow. You'll fall on your face and you'll worship him. And your tongue will confess that he's Lord to the glory of God the Father, whether you want to or not. And if you don't do it willfully and joyfully now while you are alive, you will do it on the day of your judgment. As Christ gives you the great smackdown, and he smacks you down into eternal fire and flames and weeping and gnashing of teeth forever and ever and ever. So here's a good thing you can kind of take with you. If you seek him now, you'll know him as Lord and Savior. If you seek him now, you can know him as Lord, Master, Father, Abba Father, Daddy. You can know him as the one that can take care of you in every situation. The one who will pick you up in times of trouble. He'll cover you with his pinions, with his wings, and his peace every day. You can know him that way now. Seek him now, and you'll know him as Savior, the one that can save you from your sins, save you from his wrath, and save you from hell. Or... You can seek him after you die. And you'll, then you'll know him as judge. Because that's all he'll be, is your judge. And he'll have to judge you according to your righteousness. And Jesus says, unless your righteousness, he told the disciples one time, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees and the religious leaders, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, these people were the holiest looking people in all the world. People thought these people, are nobody's holier than these guys. And Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds theirs, what do you think of them? 
You'll by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And Peter stands up and he says, but Jesus, then who then can be saved? Who? Because nobody can be as holy as those guys. Nobody can be holier than those guys. Those guys are the holiest guys in all the world. And Jesus says, for man, things are impossible. But for God, things are possible. If you can say Jesus is the ruler of your life, your Lord and master now, then please, people, Please, if you're listening now, no, that's not me. No, I don't, I mean, I don't follow Jesus. I mean, I believe in him. I mean, I know about Jesus. I, I know what he said, but I don't do the things that Jesus told me to do. I don't obey him. He's not my master. He's not my owner. He's not my ruler. Then please, for you, because I love you, seek him today while you're still alive. And when he reveals himself to you, because he will, all those that seek will find. All those that ask shall receive, and all those who knock, the door will be open to you. Seek him now while it's still time, while you still have breath in your lungs. Seek him now. And when he reveals himself to you, Surrender your life to him quickly before you change your mind because God never changes his mind. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And he wants people to get saved. He wants people to come to know Christ and have a relationship with him. And then he wants you to serve him. Not because he's some harsh taskmaster and some evil guy. He wants you to serve him so that his kingdom can grow on this planet because he wants other people to get saved. Not just you. He didn't just want you to get saved just for you. He wanted you to get saved and serve him so that you could help bring other people in because that's his heart. His heart is I want everybody to be saved. Not just you. Not just you. Not just you. He wants everybody to get saved. Seek him. Give your life to him now if you haven't already. And stop fooling around and get in his word daily and grow in a relationship with him daily. And stop living for you and live for Christ. Turn now, please, and repent before it's too late and you take your last breath. Your lungs are going to stop breathing air one day. Your eyes are going to go black someday. And then that's it. You go into eternity and you face God face to face. And if you didn't seek him now, you'll know him as judge then. And he'll judge you according to to your righteousness, which we have no righteousness apart from the great high priest. Turn now before it's too late. God loves you. He wants to save you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this word today. Thank you so much, Jesus, that you are a great high priest. Thank you, Jesus, so much that you are never wrong, that you're always righteous and you're always right in all the things that you do. And Lord, if we follow you, Lord, <laughs> Lord, we can have eternity, new life now and everlasting life later, Jesus. Thank you so much that you've given us this gift and these gifts. Thank you so much. I just pray, Lord God, right, right now for everybody listening that's not yours, that hasn't turned to you and hasn't surrendered to you, Lord, is not working that w their way toward you and, and serving you and get coming to serve you more and dying to themselves more. And they haven't even started the sanctification process, Lord God, because we don't become perfect when we get saved today. It's perfection is a process that happens over time, over years, Lord, as you chasten us, as you work on us, Lord. I pray for those people that aren't even working their way toward holiness, Lord. I pray for their salvation. I pray that today would be the day that they would come to know Christ. Today would be the day that they would fall on their faces, on their floors, at their homes right now and cry out to you and say, God, I'm sorry. I don't want to be this way anymore. I need Jesus. And I pray, Lord God, that you, you would see their heart, Lord, as you, your eyes go to and fro upon all the earth, seeking to see whose heart is strong towards you. And as they want their hearts, as they come before you, and as they fall down before you, and as they want you, and they want, Lord, they, their hearts start, want to become loyal to you, Lord God, you come to them and visit them, and just like you did me. And come snatch them up and bring them to Christ and come into their hearts and come into their lives, Lord. And, Make them to be born again. Make them to be saved. Please, God, draw people to your son, Jesus. 
And Lord, for those of us that are with you, are walking with you, Lord, I pray that we would walk stronger with you today. <laughs> Realizing that we can't work our way to being good, but Lord, we sure, Lord, we love you so much. We just, we just want to do things for you, Lord. I pray we'd serve you out of the gratefulness of our hearts, Lord God. We'd serve you out of our love. We'd serve you just because of the things that you've done for us. Help us, Lord God, to grow stronger and stronger in you, towards you, with you, and for you, and to serve you daily, dear God, with our lives. And I ask these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen.